If answers won't come or you're stuck in negative patterns, changing your questions will change your outlook and your ability to take action. You know, why me? Why can't I? We've all heard those a million times. Laura Berman Fortang will inspire you to ask new questions to get better results. Let's welcome Laura. That was rehearsed. <laughs> that music was just too irresistible. It's like, it's a pageant. All right. But I'm here to talk about human beings and their problems. I am. When us humans face problems, what do we do? Some of us, we tackle it head on. Some of us, we dance and pretend it's not there. Some of us, get totally paralyzed, and others of us suffer. We suffer, especially if it's a deep emotional problem or an existential one, right? And when we start suffering, we start asking, why? Why is this happening? Why me? Why them? Why them and not me? <laughs> right? When I was in my 20s, I had a lot of why questions. I had a nervous breakdown, in fact. I had, was hit with a big depression. It was 18 months in getting to its height and 18 months in the unraveling. And what brought it on was that no one had worked harder at, than me at their dream to become a Broadway star, and it wasn't working out. <laughs> I'd become anorexic and exercise bulimic. That's like when you eat one little thing and you go, oh my god, I got to go work out for three hours. Yes. And I also spent no time with the people I loved because I was too busy building my career. And being in the theater, well, I hung out with gay men, so. <laughs> being able to fall in love with a straight one was really not gonna happen. So, you know, just regular middle-class actress white girl problems. <laughs> now, I had had four years of therapy before what I call the dark curtain fell on my life. So when it really started getting bad, like sleeping for days on end, spinning intrusive and dark thoughts in my mind, seriously considering suicide, I decided, not that I would recommend this to anyone, but I decided to stop therapy altogether. I figured it got me here. How good could it be? <laughs> so I gathered up all my self-help books, and I started to create and devise a way to change the thoughts in my head. I literally spent so much time and attention daily picking each thought and changing it out for another, like you would with cassette tapes. Remember, it was the 80s, people, right? <laughs> so, so now you would just be fast-tracking on, um, fast on your MP3 player, right? So it's changing the tapes in my mind, and I started to see a difference. Fast forward three years from that dark period, and I was one of the first trained and credentialed personal coaches in the US, helping other people take their careers in new directions. Fast forward five years from that dark period, and I was plucked out of obscurity to write my first book, which got me on Oprah. Thank you. Fast forward 22 years from the dark curtain, and I'm standing in front of you today, and there are five books. And I speak for companies, and I've had corporate spokesperson work, and I write for Huffington Post, and yada, yada, yada. And I've never had another recurrence of a big depression. Thanks. And so what I've come to share with you today is one of the tools that I've used and one of the tools that I use with my clients that help them come upon more quickly clear solutions to their life and work problems. And that tool is questions. Ask better questions, get better results. See, what happens when we start suffering is that we ask why, right? So why is probably the worst question we could ask. Unless you're trying to cure cancer or come up with some kind of engineering or scientific innovation, why has no business in the human lexicon? <laughs> Have you ever gotten a good answer for yourself when you say, why? <laughs> How about, you know, or when you say, why is this happening to me? Or maybe some of you have children. Have you ever gotten a good answer when you ask, why did you lie? 
Or why did you put crayon on the wall? Or why did you back the car into the tree? Why does not give you good answers, okay? So, but what brings us to why as human beings is right here on this napkin. When we have a problem, we want to understand it. We want to understand it. We want to see it upside down and forwards and backwards. We want to understand the cause of it. And now think about when you help other people, right? You're just waiting to jump right in there and help them fix it, right? You're listening for it, right? So as human beings, we want to understand it. But understanding it is not enough. If we really want solutions, the problem solver themselves needs to change. We need to shift internally. We almost have to change our identity. There's a difference between someone who fixes problems and someone who finds solutions. Let me repeat that, slight distinction. There's a difference between people who want to fix a problem and people who want to find a solution. Now, it sounds like just semantics, but it's more than that. It's really your worldview. So let me show you what I mean. Um, gentlemen, if I may address you in the room. Have any of you men been, ever been accused of not listening? <laughs> and more specifically, more specifically, have you been accused of jumping in and trying to fix something before you even listen to the problem? Gentlemen, <laughs> problem fixers. But ladies, we are not innocent. Ladies, listen up. How many of us love to be the one that can save the day? Come on. I don't care how much you bitch and gossip about it. We love to be the one that can solve the whole thing for everybody, right? So look, we are attached to problems. Guys like to fix, girls like to be the hero. So this is why it's hard for us to just move on with problems. We need to investigate them. So we have to shift ourselves from the fixer to the solution seeker. And that's going to change the questions that we ask, OK? So when we're trying to figure out a problem and we're a fixer, we ask who, what, why, when, and how. Just like a good reporter, right? Who, what, why, when, how, who was there, what happened? Tell me the good gossip. Give me the juice. Ah, yeah. It's very satisfying. It's like getting into the situation room on CNN or with the president. You know, you get in the situation room. I can fix this situation. I've seen this before. Oh, they need me. I'm the one. Oh, yeah. Now, these questions that we normally ask, they're also what I call information questions. Like, they give us information. But is the information useful? Is the information going to lead to a solution? It may make us feel empowered that we know so much, but does it really need to be something we have to do? I'm going to show you that you don't need as much information as you think to solve a problem. If you're going to switch to the other side, right, it goes like this. Think back to me with the therapy. If I had remained a problem fixer, I would have gone into therapy again, and I would have understood my problem so much better. And then when I understood my problem so much better and paid my therapist week after week after week, then we'd have to have five sessions to discuss why I'm quitting and why I feel ready to leave. <laughs> and <laughs> forgive me, therapist. But I only would have become better versed in my problem, maybe eventually find a solution. But I was ready to get a life. I was sick of looking at my navel. I wanted to look at the horizon, right? So I shifted from what was wrong to what was right, and from what was right to how do I build a future. And that happens when we change our questions. So we want questions that light our brain up. And those kind of questions, see the little baby head? It's because it makes us like innocent and, and, and in wonder. When we ask the questions that bring forward motion and solution, when we ask the questions that bring out our brilliance, you know, when we have the answers for other people, we think we're brilliant. But it's really more empowering to let other people find their own answers through our questions. You know why? Because when it's their idea, they do it. Have you ever given someone a good idea? And they're like, yeah, yeah, good idea, and then they never do anything about it? And then how many of those people come back to you a week, a month, a year later, and go, hey, I have a great idea? And it's exactly the idea you gave them. That happens because until they own it, they don't do anything about it. So don't bother giving people the answer. It may make you feel good, but they're not going to change at all. Help people find their own brilliance. They'll still love you. They'll still seek you out, and you'll have a lot less stress. I promise. All right, so what are those questions then? The questions that bring out great answers, I call wisdom access questions, or WAQs, WACs for short, because they kind of whack you upside the head and cause a great answer to tumble out. 
And that great answer is usually with forward motion and solution. Now, interestingly enough, what I found working with clients, the questions that are most impactful to get answers begin with the word what. All right, they begin with the word what. Um, what questions are very specific? You know, what are you going to do is very specific. It causes a search engine effect on the brain. It makes the brain hop to and give an answer, right? So interestingly enough, there are a few exceptions to the rule of beginning your questions with what. Like, what's wrong with you is not a wisdom access question. <laughs> Neither is, what should I do? And my personal favorite is this one. That's not a wisdom access question. <laughs> that will not access wisdom, OK? Uh, all right? So <laughs> we, we do not want that to happen. So when we say that or something else, we're not accessing wisdom. What, we, what that should sound like is, if you're asking all the time, why is this happening to me? You've got to ask, what can I learn from this? If you ask, why do they get all the luck? You're going to change that to, what can I take from watching them? Or if you ask, why do I suck at this? You've got to turn around and say, what part of this can I own? And finally, what should I do? You've got to turn into, what are my options? Now, did you notice? There were two what's there. What should I do and what are my options? So it's not just the words. You got to watch the intention. What should I do? Looking at the navel. <laughs> what are my options? Look at the horizon. Look at the energy behind that. Stress and fear? OK, I'm willing to take a look. I'm willing to move forward. That's a wisdom access question. So when I was the agitated waitress, <laughs> that's my hair. I had a lot more hair in the 80s. Um, I was still agitated, but this man, a straight one, fell in love with me, and I fell in love with him, and he asked me to marry him. It was horrible. <laughs> Absolutely horrible, because we were both actors, you see, and even though there was love there, there was a lot of pushback from family and friends, like, yeah, you're both actors. How are you going to make any money? How are you going to stay above the poverty level? And I was still in that big depression. So God only knows what the man saw in me. But, but my mind was still having daily volcanic eruptions of doubt and fear, huge ones. And so here comes along this nice man. And um, no one wanted me to marry him. But I started going to work every day at my restaurant that I worked at, by the way. I didn't mention that it's the 80s. It's a gay restaurant, and it's in the village in New York City. Just so you get it, OK? And, and everyone called each other Mary, and I didn't understand why. No, I'm not kidding. It took me a long time to catch on, but I did. Anyway, so one day I was at work, and I was you know, going about like a crazy person. What should I do? What should I do? Should I marry this guy? What's going on? And the bartender asked me a question that changed my life. The bartender's name was Mohan. Mohan was a short guy, probably about 5'7", shiny bald head, big gray fuller brush mustache. He wore all white. He was a yogi and a massage therapist and a bartender. Because <laughs> even yogis like cash. <laughs> and I was standing at the end of the bar where the servers asked for their drinks. And he sees me from across the way. He can tell I'm agitated. And he just comes down to my end of the bar, looks me straight on, and he says, honey. What does your soul say? <laughs> I've been married to the man in question for 21 years, and we have three kids. <laughs> Mohan, Mohan asked me a what question. Mohan used a whack, and he didn't even know it. A wisdom access question. Because he stopped asking why and trying to understand me, and he just got to my brilliance. And that's what I want you to do for you. You know how I measure my success now with my coaching clients? By how many times I hear, I hate you. <laughs> I do. Because if I've asked a really good question and they say, I hate you for asking that, I'm like, sonny, yeah, we go. <laughs> that is a good day. And it's because when that happens, they have faced a fear. They have overcome something. And they're uncomfortable. Discomfort equals growth. I'm OK with that. I worked with a woman once who she was engaged to be married to a man 20 years her senior. She wanted kids. He had two grown kids. He didn't want any more kids. She 
wanted to keep up with her job. He didn't want a wife who worked. She wanted to stay in the, she wanted to go out to the country. He wanted to stay in the city. All her friends were urging her not to marry this guy. One of them knew me. I was like, hey, you as her coach, could you like get her not to marry this guy? <laughs> and that, I said, that's not my job, but I can ask her a question. What makes it okay for you to twist yourself like a pretzel to make this work? Two weeks later, she told me she broke off the engagement. I worked with another guy. He worked in a corporation, and he was putting out fires and doing emergencies in other people's departments. And he was starting to get, you know, he loved it. Problem fixer, hello? He loved it, but he was starting to get stressed. He wasn't getting his own work done. So I asked him, I asked him a question. What is the source of these problems? And he said, they have no leadership. Ah, he changed his strategy from fixing all their problems to helping them find a new leader. Now, the last story is a woman who was stressing out about her resume. And she was trying to put it together for a new job. And she was going crazy about it, kept talking about this senior VP role and the director role. I said, you know, wait, 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 what do you really want? She said, I want this director role, but I think I have to be a senior VP before I can get it. And I asked her another question. I said, what keeps you from applying for the directorship? She's like, nothing. She now holds that director position. So don't ask why, don't try to understand, get out of the situation room, ask what. And you will have less stress, you'll have people who don't need you as much to solve their problems, and you'll be brighter and clearer. So it is your turn. Think of something that is weighing on your heart and mind today. A business decision, a life decision, something you've been trying to mull. Take a deep breath. Allow me to ask you a question. Honey, what does your soul say? <laughs> Thank you very much.